In this lecture, we are going to cover chemistry for biology. And you might wonder, why are we learning about chemistry in a biology class? And what you need to understand is that chemistry is fundamental to biology because cells, which are the fundamental unit of life, are simply a collection of chemical reactions. And so we have to understand some chemistry in order to understand how life works. So we're gonna start out this lecture by talking about the structure of atoms. Chemistry is the study of interactions between atoms and molecules. Matter can be defined as anything that takes up space and has mass. And the fundamental unit of matter is the atom. So if we look at an atom, there are two main parts to the atom. We have the nucleus, which is gonna be in the center of the atom, and orbiting around it, we have our electron shells. And so in the nucleus of the atom, that's where you're gonna find particles called protons or neutrons. Protons carry a positive charge. Neutrons are neutral or no charge. And around the nucleus, again, in the electron shells, this is where you're gonna find the electrons. And electrons carry a negative charge. So if I look at this hydrogen atom, notice that it has one proton and one electron. The positives and the negatives cancel, and this atom has an overall no net charge. So when we talk about atoms that have no net charge, what that tells you is that the number of protons is equal to the number of electrons because again, protons are positive, electrons are negative. And so let's talk more about the atom. An element is any substance that cannot be reduced to any simpler set of constituent substances through chemical means. Each element is defined by the number of protons in its nucleus. For example, hydrogen always has one proton in its nucleus. Oxygen has eight. Carbon has six. For an element, you can't change the number of protons and have the same element. If you change the number of protons, you change the element. And so that is something that cannot be changed. Now, life requires 25 essential elements. The main four that make up about 96% of the human body would be oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen. And so if you look, these four elements make up 96% of the human body. Now, there are elements that make up about 4%. We have calcium. Calcium plays a role in uh, muscle contraction. We have phosphorus, plays a role in certain macromolecules. Potassium, um, sodium, those play an important role in electrical impulses in neurons. We have sulfur, which is found in proteins. We have chlorine, which regulates salt balance. We have magnesium. You'll notice at the bottom, we have our trace elements. Trace elements are required in very small amounts. While they're only required in small amounts, they are still necessary. So some examples of trace elements that we need to prevent disease, one example would be iron. Iron is important because it is part of a molecule called hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is a protein in your red blood cells. And that protein's job is to pick up oxygen when the blood circulates to the lungs. And the oxygen is gonna bind to the hemoglobin, bind to the iron, and it's going to allow hemoglobin to carry oxygen throughout the body because all the cells in your body need oxygen to make ATP. So if you don't transport oxygen effectively, your cells are not gonna make enough ATP. This results in a condition known as anemia. So if you've ever heard that somebody is anemic, what that means is they have a problem with their hemoglobin. It's possible that they don't have enough red blood cells circulating, maybe they've lost blood, for example, and if they don't have enough blood, they don't have enough hemoglobin, and therefore they don't transport oxygen effectively. And one of the treatments for anemia is 
sometimes an iron supplement. Doctors will prescribe an iron supplement because your cells can't make uh, hemoglobin without the iron. So you have to take an iron supplement, which would help produce more hemoglobin and therefore transport oxygen effectively. And so that is an example of a trace element that you do still need. Another trace element is gonna be iodine. Iodine deficiency prevents the production of th thyroid hormones. Your thyroid is a gland in your neck, and if you have a deficiency in iodine, you get what's known as a goiter. The thyroid gets enlarged, you get this large mass in your neck, and that's a condition known as goiter. Now, in the US, you don't see much in terms of iodine deficiency. You don't see often people walking around with goiter. Think about if there's anything that you buy that is labeled that iodine is added to it. So just think for a minute. Is there anything that you buy that iodine is added? If you look at salt, salt says iodized salt. They add iodine to salt, to sodium chloride, to help protect against goiter. Because again, all you need is a very small amount and it protects against disease. And so that would be another example of a trace element needed in small amounts. Now, remember I said that for an element, the element, you cannot change the number of protons. If you change the number of protons, you change the element. And the number of protons is referred to as the atom's atomic number. So when we talk about atomic number, we're talking about the number of protons. So helium with two protons has an atomic number of what? So what would helium's atomic number be if it has two protons? Answer, it has an atomic number of two. The mass number is the sum of the protons and the neutrons in the nucleus. The number of electrons does not factor into the mass number. The reason for that is, let me give you an analogy to explain the difference in mass between, let's say, a proton and an electron. So imagine in one hand you have a bowling ball, and in the other hand you have a lifesaver. Which one has a greater mass, the bowling ball or the lifesaver? And if you said the bowling ball, you'd be correct, right? That bowling ball has a much heavier mass, right? Think of in terms of weight. Weight and mass are not exactly the same, but just to give you an idea, because we always think in terms of weight, right? The bowling ball has a much larger mass than the lifesaver. That's like the difference between the protons and the electrons. The proton's mass is much, much greater than that of the electron, and so it makes the mass of the electron so small that it's negligible. It doesn't matter because its mass is so small that it doesn't contribute to the overall mass. So the bowling ball and the lifesaver are gonna be very different. So we don't need to include the mass of the lifesaver. So if we look at helium and we look in the nucleus of the atom, you'll notice that we have two protons and two neutrons. So what would helium's mass number be? Answer, four. Helium has a mass number of four and it has an atomic number of two. So mass number is gonna be four, atomic number is gonna be two. Now, although all atoms of an element have the same atomic number, some differ in mass number. So again, you cannot change the number of protons or you change the element. So if an element differs in their mass number, what that tells you is that the component of the atom that changes is not the proton, but instead is the neutron. And if the atom changes its number of neutrons, we call it an isotope. Isotopes have the same number of protons and electrons, but a different number of neutrons. For example, one isotope of carbon has eight neutrons instead of six. So standard carbon has six neutrons, but an isotope of carbon has eight. 
and it's written C14. So the 14 is the superscript. So C14 is an isotope of carbon. Normal carbon, standard carbon, is carbon 12. This number, again, this 12 is the mass number. It's number of protons plus number of neutrons. Carbon always has six protons. So carbon 12 has six neutrons. Carbon 14, if the mass number is 14 and six of those are protons, that means that carbon 14 has eight neutrons. So what makes carbon 12 and carbon 14 different is that they have a different number of neutrons. What makes them both carbon? What makes them both carbon is that they have the same number of protons. They both have six protons and that's why they are carbon. Now, unlike carbon 12, carbon 14 is unstable or radioactive. And this radioactive isotope gives off energy. It's unstable and it decays over time. And so one of the advantages of having these radioactive isotopes is that in medicine, they can be used as tracers because the cells can't differentiate between isotopes. To a cell, carbon is carbon, whether it's carbon 12 or carbon 14. And so we can use these radioactive isotopes as a way to measure um, where an element is being used in the body. For example, if we were worried about a problem with the thyroid, right? The thyroid has, uh, needs iodine. So we can use radioactive iodine as a tracer because if you ingest, um, if you take in that radioactive iodine, the body doesn't know that it's radioactive and anywhere that iodine would be used, that radioactive isotope would be utilized. And those radioactive isotopes give off energy, they're unstable, and as a result, we can measure them on machines. And so we can see where these radioactive isotopes are being utilized by the body. And so radioactive isotopes, while not good in high doses, right? If you've ever seen um, about Chernobyl, for example, radioactive isotopes are not good but in very small amounts, they can be useful for certain purposes, like acting as tracers in medicine. Down below, what you're looking at is hydrogen atom. Hydrogen atom has one proton and no neutrons. What is hydrogen's atomic number? Hydrogen's atomic number is one. What is hydrogen's mass number? Mass number is one because we have one proton and we have zero neutrons, so it has a mass number of one. Notice it has one electron because in an uncharged element, the number of protons equals the number of electrons, so those are equal, there's no net charge. Deuteridium is an isotope of hydrogen. It's still hydrogen because it has one proton, and that one proton is characteristic of hydrogen. However, deuteridium also has one neutron. One proton plus one neutron has a mass number of two. Deuteridium do refers to two. So notice that my number of protons did not change. I still have one proton. I still have one electron, but what is now different is gonna be that neutron. Tritium, tritium tri means three. Tritium has a mass number of three. It's still an isotope of hydrogen because it has one proton, but it has two neutrons. And so combined, it has a mass number of three. And so that is isotopes. So if we look at a periodic table, you can see that these periodic tables are arranged in rows and columns. So the top, for example, hydrogen and helium, they're in the same row. Going down the periodic table, those are referred to as columns. And we'll talk a little bit more about the rows and columns in a little bit. But what I want you to notice is that the number on the top of the periodic table, that is an atom's atomic number. 
remember that the atomic number is equal to what? And that is the number of protons. The bottom number is referred to as the atomic mass. That is going to be the number of protons. I'll just abbreviate number of protons plus number of neutrons. Right, the atomic mass is the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. Now, you might notice when you look at the periodic table that the numbers on the bottom are not always whole numbers. So for helium it is, but let's say we look at carbon, for example. Notice that under carbon, it says 12.01. And you might wonder, well, how do you have 0.01 of a particle? And the answer is you don't. What that number is on the periodic table, it's actually the weighted average of the isotopes, meaning they weight that um, atomic mass based on how abundant that particular isotope is. And so when you're trying to determine how many protons, how many neutrons, et cetera, you just go ahead and round that number to the nearest whole number. So let's look at an example, so sodium. Here is sodium over here. That's our sodium. So what I want you to do is I want you to pause and I want you to try and work through this on your own. So for sodium, based on that periodic table, what is the atomic number? What is the atomic mass? Based on that number, how many protons will it have? How many neutrons will it have? and how many electrons will it have? So pause your video and when you're ready, when you've worked this out yourself, push play and then go through and hear the answers. So if I look at sodium, the top number, remember, is the atomic number. So sodium has an atomic number of 11. If we look at the atomic mass, that's the number on the bottom. Notice for sodium, it says 12.99. So we're gonna round that to 23. So if we look at sodium, number of protons is going to be 11 because the atomic number is equal to the number of protons. Can that ever change? Answer is no. It cannot be sodium and have a different number of protons. So the number of protons does not change. Number of neutrons, how many neutrons does sodium have? Answer? 12, because the atomic mass is the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. Atomic number is the number of protons. So if we're trying to figure out the number of neutrons, so number of neutrons is equal to atomic mass minus the atomic number. That is going to give you the number of neutrons. So that's why for sodium, if we have an atomic mass of 23 and an atomic number of 11, 23 minus 11 is gonna give you 12 neutrons. For sodium, the number of electrons, if the element is uncharged, notice there's no charge next to sodium, the number of protons is equal to the number of electrons. So this is gonna be 11 because protons are positive, neutrons are neutral, and electrons carry a negative charge. And so you should be able to look at a periodic table if given one on an exam, and you should be able to tell me the atomic mass and the atomic number. And then you should also know how many protons does that have, how many neutrons, how many electrons. You do not need to memorize the periodic table. If I ask you a question related to that, I will give you enough information to be able to answer that question. So this is just showing you a different periodic table. And I just kind of liked to put this in here because it shows you some uses for some of these elements. So like if we look at fluorine, for example, Fluorine is used in toothpaste. 
and it's used because it will inhibit bacterial growth. So it's used to protect the health of your teeth. Lithium, lithium, so Li over here, lithium is used, for example, in batteries. And so this is, again, just to kind of show you some different uses for these different elements. By no means do you need to memorize this table. So when we talk about the structure of an atom, again, the nucleus of the atom is where we're going to find the protons and the neutrons. Around that nucleus is going to be the electron shell. And so the electrons are going to exist in these distinct shells around the nucleus. The first shell, the one closest to the nucleus, contains a maximum of two electrons. That orbital only holds two electrons. So if I look at hydrogen, hydrogen has an atomic number of one. What that means is hydrogen has one proton. Because protons and neutrons cancel each other out, that also means that hydrogen has one electron. So it has one electron in its first shell. Helium. Helium has an atomic number of two, which means that helium has two protons and two electrons. So notice that its um, electron shells are going to contain two electrons. If we look at lithium, lithium has an atomic number of three. What that means is that it has three protons. What that also means is that it has three electrons. Two electrons can occupy the first shell, so notice that there's only two in the first shell, which means that the third one, right, because there's going to be three electrons total, the third one is going to exist in the second shell. So the first shell, the one closest to the nucleus, holds a maximum of two electrons. The second and the third shell both contain eight electrons maximum. So like in neon, where neon has eight electrons in its outer shell, that outer shell is called the valence shell. So the outermost shell is called the valence shell, and the outer electrons are referred to as the valence electrons. It's the valence electrons that are going to dictate whether or not a chemical bond forms. So I'll talk about that more in a minute. So notice that neon has an atomic number of 10. What that means is that neon has 10 protons. Neon also then has 10 electrons. Two electrons in the first shell, eight in the second shell, right? So two plus eight is gonna give us our 10. If we then look at sodium, sodium has an atomic number of 11. What does that tell us? Well, that tells us that it has 11 protons in its nucleus. Total, it also has 11 electrons. Two in the first shell, eight in the second, so two plus eight is 10. It has one in the third shell. So the second and the third shell hold a maximum of eight. That is what we call the octet rule. Oct refers to eight. They hold a maximum of eight. Now, there are exceptions to the rule. There are times where um, the second or the third shell could potentially have more than eight, but for the sake of this class and to keep it simple, we're going to go with what usually happens, and that is that the second shell holds a maximum of eight and the third shell holds a maximum of eight as well. You won't need to understand those um, exceptions to the rule. So this is a question for you. Oxygen is an element with an atomic number of eight. Based on this information, which of the following statements is true? Red, oxygen can be broken down into simpler component substances. Yellow, each oxygen atom will always have eight protons. Green, each oxygen atom will always have eight neutrons. Blue, each oxygen atom will always have four electrons. Or purple, protons plus electrons is eight. So for this question, I'm not going to provide the answer in the video. Instead, what I'm going to do with this question is I'm going to put on Canvas a practice quiz 
And the purpose of the practice quiz is for you to familiarize yourself with the protocol needed for Respondus, which is our online testing protocol, so that you can test in this practice quiz without it being your actual exam. That way you can make sure that Respondus is working properly. This will be graded simply for participation, meaning that as long as you do the practice quiz, you will get your points. But again, the practice quiz is more for you just to make sure that your computer setup is ready to work with Respondus. So this will have a big window for you to do it, um, but you definitely wanna do this before you have any of your tests. So that way you can make sure that you can use Respondus. So I will post the answer um, on the quiz. You'll get feedback right away when you take the quiz to make sure that you get these answers correct. So we won't cover them in the video. So now we're going to look at chemical bonding. Electron arrangement determines the chemical property of an atom. Only electrons are involved in chemical activity. Chemical bonding comes about when atoms seek their lowest energy state, when they are the most stable. An atom achieves a state when it has filled its outer electron shell. So atoms will form chemical bonds in order to fill its outer shell. So to accomplish this, to fill their outer shell, atoms can share, donate, or receive electrons. So there's multiple ways that they can fill their outer shells. This results in attraction between atoms, which we then call a chemical bond. So if two atoms are sharing electrons, that bond between those atoms, those are going to be your chemical bonds. Or if one atom donates and one receives, those two atoms are gonna be attracted, that's gonna form a chemical bond. And so again, atoms are gonna seek out and try and fill their outermost shell because that's when they are most stable. So there are three types, main types of chemical bonds. We have a covalent bond. Covalent bond is where atoms share one or more electron pairs. We have an ionic bond where one atom is gonna lose and another atom is going to accept electrons. So one is gonna donate, one is gonna receive, and then those elements are gonna be attracted to one another. And then the last one is going to be the hydrogen bond. And the hydrogen bond is where we have a covalently linked hydrogen. So a hydrogen that's already in a covalent bond that can react with an electronegative atom like oxygen. I will come back to this definition a little bit later on in this lecture because you have to understand things like electronegativity in order for a hydrogen bond to make sense. But I just wanted to put it here because this slide just summarizes our three types of chemical bonds. So if we look at our periodic table, so notice that our rows are basically aligned based on how many shells they have. So notice that the first row, the top row, only has electrons in the first shell. The second row means that those atoms have electrons in the second shell. The third row has electrons in the third shell. So now if we look at the columns, right, going down, notice that we have hydrogen, lithium, and sodium. All three of those atoms have one valence electron. So I want you to look at what do the elements on the far right of the periodic table have in common? So what does helium, neon, and argon all have in common? So those three elements, what they have in common is that they all have their outer shells full. Their outermost shell is full because helium has two. It only has two electrons in that shell. Neon, Argon have eight in the second and third shell respectively. Those outer shells are full. So these particular elements are unreactive. 
they do not need to form chemical bonds because their outermost shell is already full. Remember that the reason that atoms form chemical bonds is to fill their outer shell. Those elements don't need to form chemical bonds because their outermost shell is full and they're already stable. So that's what those columns in the periodic table are for. So this is just showing you some electron configurations of different atoms. And so you'll notice that this is the electron arrangement for the main four. Remember that the main four elements are hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. Those make up 96% of the human body. When we talk about our macromolecules in the next part, what you're gonna see is that these four elements are the main components in macromolecules. So these have a very important role. Hydrogen has an atomic number of one. What that means, hydrogen has one proton. So it has one proton in its nucleus, it has one electron in its first shell, and it needs one more to fill its outer shell. So it has one, it needs one. So notice that this element is half full. Carbon. Carbon has an atomic number of six. What that means is that carbon has six protons. What that also means is that carbon has six electrons. Two in the first shell, four in the second shell, because two plus four is six. So in its second shell, carbon has four valence electrons, and it needs four more. Carbon is also half full. You're gonna see that later on, the fact that carbon and hydrogen are both half full is an important concept, and I'll come back to that later. Nitrogen has an atomic number of seven. Atomic number of seven means seven protons. It also means that nitrogen has seven electrons. Two electrons in the first shell, five in the second shell. Two and five is seven. Notice that nitrogen needs three more. One, two, three. Oxygen. Oxygen has an atomic number of eight. Atomic number of eight means that oxygen has eight protons. It also means that oxygen has eight electrons. Two electrons in the first shell, six in the second shell. Two and six, right, will make eight. Oxygen needs two more. Now, the reason that I'm pointing this out is the easiest way to remember how many electrons these need is I remember the acronym HONK, except that the end is a C and not a K, so HONK. Hydrogen is going to form one bond, meaning it only needs one more electron to fill its outer shell. Oxygen needs two, right? It needs two more valence electrons. Nitrogen needs three, carbon needs four. So hydrogen needs one to fill its outer shell, oxygen needs two, nitrogen needs three, carbon needs four. So you can remember that as honk. These four elements, if I ask you questions related to these four, I will not give you atomic numbers. You should know these four. They're not hard because again, if you can remember honk, one, two, three, four. That's the number of electrons more that they need. So this is just showing you some different electron configurations. So this is a class demo. I will do this class demo on the Zoom. So just be aware that we will cover this on the Zoom meeting. A compound is a substance consisting of two or more different elements, key here being different. So two or more different elements combined in a fixed ratio. And there are many compounds that consist of only two elements. An example would be table salt or sodium chloride, which is also written NaCl. The Na is for the sodium, the Cl is for the chloride. And interestingly, sodium itself is a metal and chlorine is a poisonous gas. Yet, when you put this metal and this poisonous gas together, you get this emergent property. 
And this emergent property is that now by mixing these two elements, you get a new compound, which is sodium chloride. And sodium chloride, when combined, is an edible compound. And so this is an example of a compound and an emergent property. So now we're gonna move on and talk about the different types of chemical bonds. So we'll start with the covalent bond. And a covalent bond forms when two atoms share, notice share, one or more pairs of electrons. And a molecule is formed when two or more atoms are held together by a covalent bond. The molecule could be two of the same elements, they could be different elements, that part doesn't matter, but the atoms are held together by a covalent bond. So an example of a molecule would be water, H2O. And H2O means that there are two hydrogens and one oxygen. If we look at oxygen, for example, oxygen has an atomic number of eight. What that means is that oxygen has eight protons. That also means that oxygen has eight electrons. We have two in the first shell and we have six in the second shell. So if oxygen has six in its second shell, how many more electrons does it need to fill its outer shell? And the answer is it needs two. So what happens is, is we have two hydrogen atoms. Hydrogens have one proton and one electron. And in order to fill both of their outer shells, because remember that chemical bonds form in order to fill outer shells. So to fill both of their outer shells, oxygen and hydrogen are going to share a pair of electrons. Now we can color code this. So the one from the oxygen will make be red and the ones from the hydrogen will be blue. So that when they come together and they share, they're each gonna be sharing one that came from hydrogen and one that came from the oxygen. And so they're sharing that pair of electrons. And so oxygen is participating with one of those electrons, hydrogen is participating with the other, but by sharing, notice that we've now filled both of their outer shells because now oxygen has starting up here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So oxygen has eight in its second shell. Hydrogen has two in its first shell, both of these. So now we've filled both of their outer shells. So again, chemical bonds are when atoms are going to seek to fill their outer shells, and they do that by forming these chemical bonds. And in the case of the covalent bond, they're going to share a pair of electrons. And by sharing, it fills both atoms' outer shell. And so this would be a covalent bond. So here are some different examples of a covalent bond. So we have hydrogen, H2. Hydrogen is a gas and H2, notice there are two hydrogens together. It's still a molecule because they're held together by a covalent bond. Notice that if you look in the electron diagrams, you can see that they are sharing one pair. You can see this in the Lewis dot formula. So this is the Lewis dot structure where we draw the electrons as dots. So they're sharing one pair. You can also see a single covalent bond written as one line. One line represents a single covalent bond, meaning that those elements are sharing one pair of electrons. You can also see this um, distributed as a space filling model where you can see that there's two hydrogens together, and in this case, they're held together again by a covalent bond. If we look at oxygen, O2, oxygen, remember, is a gas. This is the gas that we breathe in. Oxygen needs two more electrons to fill its outer shell. So for oxygen, they can't just share one pair of electrons. If they share one pair, each oxygen only has seven. So instead, what happens if you look in the Lewis dot structure, they are sharing two pairs of electrons. And by sharing two pairs, now each oxygen has eight and has filled its outer shell. Notice that this is represented by two lines. When you see two lines between two atoms, that tells you that that is a double bond. 
There are triple bonds. Typically, that's with carbon, meaning that they're sharing three pairs of electrons because remember that carbon forms a maximum of four bonds. Water, H2O, again, they're gonna be sharing one pair of electrons. So we have two hydrogens and one oxygen. We could have methane, CH4. Um, the carbon is sharing with the hydrogen. So notice that it's four single bonds because again, carbon needs to form four bonds to fill its outer shell. And so these are just some examples of different covalent bonds. To understand about types of covalent bonds, we need to understand a little bit about electronegativity. And electronegativity, notice electronegativity, is the affinity that an atom has for electrons. Electrons have a negative charge. So a general kind of rule of thumb is that atoms that we say have a high electronegativity means that they have a high attraction or a high affinity for electrons. They really want electrons to fill their outer shell. And that's because these are gonna be atoms where the outer shells are nearly full. They might only need one electron or two electrons to fill their outer shell. And so because they only need a few electrons to fill their outer shell, they have a high affinity for electrons. They really want that last electron or those last two electrons to fill their outer shell. An example of an atom that is highly electronegative would be chlorine. Chlorine has an atomic number of 17. What that means is that chlorine has 17 protons. If chlorine has 17 protons, how many electrons does it have? 17. How many in the first shell? Two. How many in the second? Eight, right? Two and eight brings us to 10, which means that it has seven in its third shell. So notice starting up here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. How many more electrons does chlorine need to fill its outer shell? It only needs one. So because chlorine only needs one electron to fill its outer shell, it is highly, electroneg highly electronegative. It has a high affinity for electrons because it really wants that last electron to fill its outer shell. So atoms that have outer shells that are nearly full are highly electronegative. So Chlorine, for example, oxygen because oxygen needs two, nitrogen because nitrogen needs three, etc. Atoms with very little electronegativity have a low attraction for electron. They have a low affinity for electrons. And in that case, the outer shells are nearly empty. So let's look at an example. So let's say we're looking at sodium. Sodium has an atomic number of 11. How many protons? 11. How many electrons? 11. Two in the first shell, eight in the second, that brings us to 10. One in the third shell. So how many electrons would sodium need to acquire to fill their outer shell? How many would it need to take in to fill its outer shell? Answer is it would need to gain seven more. Is it likely that sodium is gonna be able to pull seven electrons from somewhere else? No, right, not very likely. So in the case of sodium, it's not trying to pull electrons, it's not trying to have an affinity for electrons, it doesn't want them. Instead, it would rather give them away because if sodium gives away this one valence electron, that second shell is full and now it's stable. So atoms like sodium have very little electronegativity. They don't have the affinity for the electrons. Instead, they would rather give them away. And so atoms that have very little electronegativity have outer shells that are nearly empty. So this would include hydrogen, carbon, sodium. These are all not very electronegative. Now, sometimes students get a little bit confused about hydrogen. Because if you recall, hydrogen has one valence electron in the first shell, and it only needs one more. So students often go, well, it only needs one more. 
Yes, but if you think about big picture, if they only have two electrons in the first shell and they have one out of two, that outer shell is only half full. If you think about carbon, carbon has four electrons in its outer shell. It needs four more. Carbon is also half full. It has half of its valence electrons. And so as a result, hydrogen and carbon actually have very similar electronegativities because they're both half full. They both have half of their valence electrons. And so they're not very electronegative. It's gonna be hard for them to fill those outer shells. So if we look at the periodic table and we look at the electronegativities, again, the far right column on your periodic table, helium, neon, argon, these are gonna be elements that are unreactive because their outer shells are already full. Fluorine, chlorine, these are electronegative. They both have seven valence electrons. They only need one more. Oxygen and sulfur need two more. They're electronegative, but a little bit less than the atoms to the right. So fluorine is more electronegative than oxygen. Chlorine is more electronegative than sulfur. That's why you're seeing this electronegativity go down. Nitrogen and phosphorus, less electronegative than the ones to the right. And then once we get here where we're at carbon and silicon, which are both half full, this diagram is a little misleading because it's showing like it's still going down. But in fact, it's more like this, where all of these elements from half full and less, these all have very little electronegativity. They don't have a high affinity for electrons because they would need to acquire too many. So these elements at the halfway mark, the carbon and silicon, and everything to the left of that, those atoms have very little electronegativity. They don't have a high affinity for electrons because that it would be too difficult for them to acquire the electrons that they needed. They would rather maybe give away electrons, for example. So if we talk about a covalent bond where the atoms are sharing electrons, we can talk about what are called polar covalent bond and nonpolar. So we'll start with our polar covalent bond. Polar covalent bond is when we get unequal sharing of electrons. And unequal sharing of electrons means that they're not sharing equally. Think of it like a tug of war, right? So if you have, you know, a 300 pound heavy duty like lifter and you have this kid who weighs 50 pounds, right? And they're doing a tug of war. Who's gonna win? The 300 pound weightlifter or the 50 pound kid? The 300 pound weightlifter, right? Same idea when you're sharing electrons. If atoms have different electronegativities, if one is much more electronegative than the other, when they share electrons, right, they're sharing, it's between the two, they're not sharing equally. The one with the greater electronegativity, the one that has the higher affinity for the electrons, is going to pull harder for those electrons. And as a result, those electrons are going to spend more time around the atom that is electronegative. So if we look at water, for example, H2O. Oxygen and hydrogen, which one is more electronegative? Oxygen, it has six valence electrons and therefore it only needs two more. Remember we said that hydrogen is only half full. It has very little electronegativity. So when oxygen and hydrogen share, they will share, but they won't share equally. Oxygen has a greater pull for the electrons. It has that greater affinity. So what ends up happening is, is that the electron spends more time around the oxygen than it does the hydrogen. Electrons are negatively charged. So what you get is you get this partial negative, this partial negative charge because that electron is not fully being stolen by oxygen. Oxygen isn't taking the electron, but the electron is spending more time around the oxygen and therefore the oxygen gets that partial negative charge. Hydrogen then, as a result, gets a partial positive. 
it gets a partial positive because remember that a hydrogen atom is simply a proton and an electron, right? So this hydrogen has one proton and if its electron is spending more time with oxygen and the electron is spending more time with oxygen, that means that the hydrogen is left with more of a positive charge because it has the proton, but the electron is not spending as much time. So the hydrogens end up with the partial positives and the oxygen ends up with this partial negative. This ends up with what we call a polar molecule. This molecule is polar. It has this charge associated with it. It's not a full charge, but it is a partial charge and that will also affect the way that molecules interact because if you have these charges on this molecule, they can interact with other things that are charged, charged as well. So for me, the way that I remember polar, I think polar pulling. If you're talking about a polar covalent bond, one atom is pulling harder than the other and that's gonna cause unequal sharing of electrons. So if you're asked a question that asks you to identify the type of chemical bond, first thing you wanna look at is you look at the atoms and you see, do they have similar electronegativities or different? In the case of oxygen and hydrogen, they have different electronegativities. And as a result, because they're not having the same affinity for electrons, when they share, they're not gonna share equally the electrons are gonna spend more time around the electronegative atom than they will the atom that is not very electronegative. So if we look at the main four elements in terms of their electronegativity, oxygen is the most electronegative because it only needs two, followed by nitrogen. So nitrogen is a little bit less electronegative because it needs three. And notice carbon and hydrogen are equal they're roughly the same. They're less than nitrogen and oxygen, but they're roughly the same because they are both half full. So if you're talking about oxygen and hydrogen, that's gonna be um, polar, right? Because oxygen and hydrogen have similar, or I'm sorry, they have different electronegativities. And so that's what you're looking for if you're trying to see if a bond is gonna be a polar covalent or a nonpolar covalent. So a nonpolar covalent bond, nonpolar, non-pulling. And what that means is that electrons are shared equally. So when these atoms form a chemical bond and they're sharing electrons, neither one has a greater affinity for the electrons. Neither one is pulling harder. So this is gonna occur between atoms with very similar electronegativity. And because they have a similar electronegativity, neither one has that greater affinity for the electrons. So the electrons are gonna be shared equally. If the electrons are shared equally, no partial charges are created because the partial charge comes from when the electron spends more time with one atom compared to another. But in this case, if they're shared equally, neither one is gonna get a partial negative or a partial positive. The molecule itself is going to remain uncharged. It's going to have no net charge, no overall charge on the molecule because the electrons are being shared equally. What types of molecules um, will be nonpolar? Hydrocarbons. Hydrocarbons refer to the fact that they are primarily carbon and hydrogen. So like lipids, for example. If I look at a fatty acid, Notice it has this long hydrocarbon chain. That long hydrocarbon chain, carbon and hydrogen, remember have similar electronegativities. So when they share, they will share, but they will share equally. There's no charge on this molecule. And so again, this is gonna happen when you're talking about elements or atoms that have similar electronegativities. If they are similar, they are going to share their electrons equally. So now we're gonna talk about the ionic bond. So we just finished with the covalent bond where we were talking about sharing electrons. Now let's look at the ionic bond where one atom is gonna donate electrons and the other is going to receive them. So ionic bonds form when electronegativities differ too much. 
meaning that one atom is so much more electronegative than the other that it's simply going to steal the electrons from the other atom. So if we look at sodium, sodium again has an atomic number of 11. So what that means is that sodium has 11 protons, right? It has 11 protons. In an uncharged sodium atom, if it has 11 protons, it also has 11 electrons so that it has no net charge. So notice that if we look at the diagram of sodium, it has two electrons in the first shell, it has eight in the second, so two plus eight is 10. It has one electron in the third shell. Let's look at chlorine. Chlorine has an atomic number of 17. What that means is that for protons, they're equal to 17. In terms of electrons, if we're talking about an uncharged chlorine, the number of electrons is also 17. So we get no net charge. So if we have 17 electrons, in the first shell we have two, second shell we have eight, so two and eight is 10, which means that there are seven in the third shell because there's 17 total. So there's seven in that third shell. So if we have seven in that third shell, chlorine only needs one more to fill its outer shell. Sodium, on the other hand, would have to acquire seven more to fill its outer shell. So do sodium and chlorine have similar electronegativities? Answer is no. They are very, very different. Chlorine is very electronegative. Sodium has very little electronegativity because it's not gonna be able to acquire seven. What does sodium do instead? It gives away its lone valence electron. And when it gives it away, now you're gonna end up with what's called an ion. An ion is an atom that has a different number of electrons and as a result ends up with a charge. Now, first let's talk about why, why would they form an ionic bond versus a covalent bond. If sodium and chlorine were to share a pair of electrons, right? If this pair here were to be shared, that pair of electrons, if they were sharing, does that fill both of their outer shells? Answer is no. It does not fill their outer shells. It would fill chlorine's outer shell, but it's not going to fulfill sodium's outer shell because that would still only have two electrons in sodium's third shell. It needs eight to fill its outer shell. So sharing that pair of electrons, not gonna happen. Sodium is going to give it to chlorine. So now if I look at my sodium ion, how many protons does my sodium ion have? Sodium ion still has to have 11 protons. Because remember, if we're calling it sodium, can the number of protons change? Answer is no, cannot change. The atomic number is still seven, and as a result, the number of protons is still 11. That cannot change. If you change the number of protons, you change the element. But how many electrons does sodium now have? So notice that when it gave away that third shell, when it gave away that one electron in its third shell, it has two in the first shell, and it has eight in the second shell. So two and eight is 10. So now sodium has 11 positive charges and 10 negative charges. So what is the overall net charge on sodium? Plus one. It has one more proton relative to the electron. So sodium ends up with this positive charge. There is a particular name for ions that have either a positive or a negative. The positively charged ion we call the cation. The way I remember this, cation has a T in it. It has a plus in it. The cation is the positively charged atom. It's the one that's going to have the positive charge. So sodium becomes a cation, 
becomes positively charged. If we look at chlorine, chlorine still has 17 protons because again, we cannot change the number of protons and have it still be chlorine. So it has 17 protons. And how many electrons does it now have? Well, if it gained one electron, it's no longer 17, it's now 18 electrons. Notice that fills chlorine's outer shell. It now becomes a chloride ion. The chloride ion has eight valence electrons now. So the overall charge on this ion, notice if we compare negatives and positives, we get a negative one charge, right? We have one more electron relative to protons. So this ion becomes negatively charged. That is what we call the anion. N negative. So I remember the cation, the T is the plus, that's the positively charged ion. The anion is the negatively charged. The N in the middle tells you negative. So now we have a sodium ion that is positively charged. We have a chloride ion that is negatively charged. And if you think about charges, if you know anything about playing with magnets and you know anything about charges, do like charges attract or do opposites attract? Answer is opposites attract. So the Paula Abdul song is right. Opposites do attract for atoms. So this positively charged sodium is going to be attracted to that negatively charged chloride ion. These opposites attract. And same thing if you're playing with magnets. If you've ever played with magnets, you'll know that when you turn them one way, they will attract and the magnets will come together. But if you try and turn one the other way and then stick them together, they don't go together, they repel. Like charges repel. Opposites though will attract. And so let's see why that's important. So when we have those oppositely charged ions because one atom gave electrons, one donated, and the other received, what you're gonna end up with is your ionic bond. So think of ionic bond between ions oppositely charged ions. So in this little crystal here, the yellow represents the sodium and the green represents the chloride. What you get is you get this crystal lattice where you get these alternating sodiums and chlorides and sodiums and chlorides because the positives are attracted to the negatives. So you end up with this salt crystal. And so now you get this new emergent property because now both of those elements are stable. Once they form that chemical bond, they both filled their outer shell and we get our emergent property. We now get table salt, which is edible. And so ionic bond is when one atom donates, the other receives, you end up with oppositely charged ions they attract, and when they attract, they're gonna to come together and form that ionic bond. So this will be another question on your practice quiz. So oxygen and hydrogen differ in their electronegativity. Thus, red, they can share electrons, but unequally. Yellow, sometimes the negative charge on the electrons turns into a positive. Green, they can share electrons equally. Blue, hydrogen is attracted to oxygen but does not bond with it. Purple, they have the same number of protons. So again, I will post this on the participation assignment as a practice quiz um, just to make sure that your respondus is working properly. And I will also provide the answer there as well. So now we're gonna move on and talk about the hydrogen bond. And remember that this is that definition that I said that you probably wouldn't understand that definition until we talked about electronegativity. So a hydrogen bond is a weak attraction between a covalently linked, slightly positive hydrogen atom, one that's already bound to oxygen or nitrogen, and that already covalently linked hydrogen is attracted to a slightly negative atom, like oxygen or nitrogen. So what does that mean? Well, if you think about water, remember that water is polar and oxygen has that partial negative, right? So here's the partial negative, 
Hydrogen has the partial positives. So what we end up with is we end up with this molecule that has these opposite charges. So if you think about this and you think about the electrons, let me change the ink to black. If you think about where hydrogen is going to have its electrons, or oxygen and hydrogen have their electrons, so remember that total within a water molecule, the oxygen is going to have eight. There's a pair shared with hydrogen. There's a pair shared with hydrogen. And then there are two what we call lone pairs. So this is one pair. Here's another pair. The oxygen is partially negative and the hydrogen is partially positive. So notice that we have an already covalently linked hydrogen. There's my hydrogen that's already in a covalent bond. And it is interacting with an electronegative atom like the oxygen. So it has this weak hydrogen bond. Those opposite charges are attracted. This bond is not very strong. So if you think about like a covalent bond where they're actually sharing, that bond is relatively strong. In terms of a hydrogen bond, we're talking about an attraction between opposite charges. That interaction is much weaker. So that's gonna be an already covalently linked hydrogen to an electronegative atom like oxygen. So in this case, you're seeing that for each water molecule, each water molecule can participate in a maximum of four hydrogen bonds. We can have one per hydrogen and then one per lone pair of electrons. So four hydrogen bonds can form at a maximum per water molecule. So when you think about a hydrogen bond, what you want to think about is that this is between molecules. The hydrogen bond is going to link molecules together. It's not within the same molecule. This right here, that bond between the oxygen and the hydrogen, that is not the hydrogen bond. Remember that that is the covalent bond. The, the hydrogen bond is the one that's between the molecules, not within one molecule, but it's between molecules. It's holding molecules together. And so that's a, hyd that's a hydrogen bond, an already covalently linked hydrogen to an electronegative atom like oxygen. If you go back to the slide before, you can see that we can see a hydrogen bond not just between water, but water and ammonia can also form a hydrogen bond. And that's because the water molecule, the hydrogens are partially positive, they can be attracted to the partially negative nitrogen because nitrogen is more electronegative than hydrogen. So they don't share equally. So hydrogen bonds can occur between an already covalently linked hydrogen to an electronegative atom like oxygen or nitrogen. So again, this will take place in the Zoom session that we're gonna talk about. So in our Zoom, we will answer this question and you guys will discuss it with other members of the class. You have nitrogen with an atomic number of seven and hydrogen with an atomic number of one. What type of bond will form between hydrogen and nitrogen, and how many hydrogens will bond with each nitrogen. So you can start working on this ahead of time, and then we will also go over this in the Zoom session. So now we need to talk about chemical reactions. So chemical reactions involve the making or breaking of bonds between atoms. A change in chemical energy occurs during a chemical reaction. If we call a reaction endergonic, endergonic, think of energy has to put in. So these reactions absorb energy. Energy must be put in. 
So I remember endergonic in, you have to put in energy. Exergonic reactions release energy. Energy exits, meaning that it's being released. So an endergonic reaction is one where you have to put in energy. An exergonic reaction is one where energy is released. So let's look at some examples. So if we're going to form a bond, if we're going to put atom A and atom B together, or ion A and ion B, if I'm going to build something, right? If I'm going to build something, compare building something to breaking something down, right? Let's say I'm trying to build a tower. I have blocks and I'm trying to build a tower. Is it going to take more energy being put in to build a tower or to break it down? Which one's gonna require a greater investment of energy? The answer is building, right? Because if I'm building something, it's gonna require more energy than it would be if I was breaking it down. So when we have these synthesis reactions where we're building something, where we're forming new bonds and we're making uh, molecules bigger, that is going to be an endergonic reaction. Endergonic because energy has to be put in. You have to put in energy to build that larger molecule. So for example, if your cell is going to store sugar, the way that animal cells store sugar is going to be through a molecule called um, glycogen. Glycogen is your storage sugar. So if you form glycogen, you have to link glucose molecules together. You have to put glucose together to form this bigger polysaccharide, this bigger sugar. That's an endergonic reaction. Energy has to be put in. So this is gonna be endergonic. We have to put in energy to form this molecule. Anabolism is the synthesis of molecules in the cell. So the way I remember this one, notice the beginning. If you think of anabolic steroids, if you've ever heard of anabolic steroids, why does somebody take anabolic steroids? What are they trying to accomplish? Answer is they're trying to build muscle, right? So anabolism is referring to the synthesis or the building of molecules in the cell. And those types of reactions are gonna be endergonic. Energy has to be put in for that new molecule to be built. On the flip side, if we have what we call a decomposition reaction, if we're breaking something down. So if we're taking AB and we're breaking it apart into A plus B, if we're breaking something down, we're breaking that bond, we are gonna release the energy that's stored in, those, in that bond. So the bond between A and B has energy stored. When we break that bond, we're gonna release energy. And that reaction is going to be exergonic. Energy is being released. Catabolism is the decomposition reaction in the cell, meaning the breakdown of molecules. The way that I think of catabolism, I think it's a catastrophe. It's like it all falls apart. It's coming apart. It's being broken down. So catabolism is the decomposition reaction. It's the breakdown of bigger molecules into the smaller parts. And when we break those bonds, we are gonna release the energy that is stored in that bond. And we will learn a lot more about this when we get to the metabolism chapters. Some reactions are what we call an exchange reactions, where we have a synthesis and a decomposition coupled together. An example of this is if we have NaOH, which is sodium hydroxide, and HCl, which is hydrochloric acid. If we mix an acid and a base together, you might know that you get what we call a neutralized solution. They will cancel each other out. And the reason for that is, is that we are gonna break these apart. So this is gonna break apart, those two pieces. This is gonna break apart. The hydroxide, this OH, is gonna form a bond with the hydrogen and the sodium is gonna form a bond with the chloride. And so we've rearranged it. And the products that we get are sodium chloride, so NaCl, plus our water molecule. 
So this is an exchange reaction. All we're doing is simply swapping pieces. Um, and so that would be an exchange reaction. Some reactions can be what we call reversible, meaning that under certain conditions, the reaction will go one way, and in another um, situation, the reaction will go in the other direction. So each direction might need a special condition to allow that to occur. So one of the things that I have here, and I switched these originally, they were on the slide backwards. The heat was at the top and the water was at the bottom. But in fact, it should be the water this way. If we break down A and B, if we're breaking down A and B, you're going to see this when we get to macromolecules, but breaking down of macromolecules is what we call a hydrolysis reaction. Hydro is referring to water. Lysis is breaking. So we use water to break it down. So this is showing that if the reaction is going this way, it requires water. So if we want to break down, we want to hydrolyze A and B, we have to put in water and then we're going to break it down to A plus B. However, if we have A plus B and now the condition is heat, heat is energy. It's kinetic energy. It's the energy of motion. So if we apply heat, the energy from heat can be used to form A and B to go together. Because remember, if we're building something, energy has to be put in. So putting A and B together, heat might facilitate that reaction. It might make that reaction possible so that now you build A and B. So this is what we call a reversible reaction. Under certain conditions, it goes one way, and under a different set of conditions, it goes the other way. Not all reactions are reversible, but some are. Now, when we talk about organic compounds, organic compounds always contain carbon and hydrogen. Carbon and hydrogen. So if you hear of the field of chemistry, that's organic chemistry. Organic chemistry is dealing with molecules that involve carbon and hydrogen. So our macromolecules, for example, would be in organic compounds. So organic compounds contain carbon and hydrogen. In organic carbon, or inorganic compounds, typically lack carbon or have carbon but not hydrogen. So an example of this would be like carbon dioxide, CO2. CO2 would be an inorganic carbon. Yes, it has um, carbon, but it doesn't have carbon and hydrogen. So that's why this would be an inorganic compound. So inorganic compounds typically lack carbon or they may have carbon, but not hydrogen also. So they don't have carbon and hydrogen. If they have carbon and hydrogen, they would be called an organic compound. Inorganic means that they don't have carbon and hydrogen together. So we're gonna move on now and talk about important properties of water. Why is water so essential to life on Earth? So the cell is primarily water. Anywhere from 70 to 95% of the cell is going to be water. And the rest are going to be carbon-based compounds primarily. So our sugars, our proteins, etc. So what this tells you is that water must be doing something very important. Because why else is the cell 70 to 95% water? Water must be doing something important. And so we're gonna look at what are the properties of water that make it essential to life on Earth. So just a reminder of water structure, water is both a compound and a molecule. It's a compound because it's two different elements. It's hydrogen and oxygen. It's a molecule because it is covalently bound, right? So two hydrogens are covalently bound to an oxygen. That's where this notation comes from, H2O. The H2 refers to two hydrogens. 
the O refers to just one oxygen. So if we look at H2O, remember that this molecule is going to be polar because oxygen and hydrogen have different electronegativities. So when they share electrons, they do not share equally. Oxygen is more electronegative. Oxygen becomes partially negative. The hydrogen, as a result, becomes partially positive. So water is a molecule that is polar. So what you're going to see is that the important properties of water are because water is polar and because water forms hydrogen bonds. And so we're, we'll walk through that. So the first property that makes water so important for life is that water has cohesion. Cohesion is the tendency of molecules of the same kind to stick together. So water molecules display cohesion. They're going to stick together. And that's because they can hydrogen bond with one another. And we saw that, right? That each water molecule can form a maximum of four hydrogen bonds. This, again, is between water molecules. So it's not within one water molecule, but between water molecules. This is a weak bond. So the bonds, these hydrogen bonds, are constantly changing. They're breaking, reforming, breaking, reforming. And so this is in, in motion. Now, why is cohesion important? One reason that cohesion is important is that it accounts for water transport in plants. It's a process that's called transpiration. Transpiration, sorry for the messy writing. So transpiration, if we think about plants, plants remember are autotrophs. They are self feeders. They can do photosynthesis. They're able to make their own food. And the way that they can make their own food is that they can take carbon dioxide, water, and sunlight, and they can build their own sugars. Now, where does photosynthesis take place in the plant? Well, photosynthesis takes place in the leaves. The leaves are where the chloroplasts are. That's the organelle where photosynthesis is gonna take place. So photosynthesis is going to happen in the leaves. Now, one thing you'll learn later on is that the leaves on the bottom side of the leaves are little pores that are called stomata. So the stomata are the pores on the underside of the leaf. When those pores are open, right, when those pores are open, the reason they open is that it allows the CO2 gas in. Because remember that you need CO2, the carbon dioxide, to do photosynthesis. So the reason that the pores open is to get in carbon dioxide. The other thing that happens when those pores are open is if you think of evaporation, right? Evaporation is the loss of water. Transpiration means that water molecules come out of those pores. They evaporate out of the pores. Now, water has cohesion. It has the ability to stick together. So as this water molecule leaves, it's hydrogen bound to the next one, which is hydrogen bound to the next one. It's like it's pulling a chain of water up the leaves, up to the leaves. If you think about where you water a plant, right, if you're trying to grow a plant, do we water the leaves? Answer is no, we water the roots. The roots are the part of the plant that are used for water absorption. They have these hairs which help increase surface area to increase um, to increase water absorption. So the water goes in through the roots, but it needs to get up to the leaves where photosynthesis takes place. Do things naturally want to go up? If I were to hold a pen and let go, is it spontaneously going to go up? Answer is no, right? Gravity pulls things down. So what that tells you is something is pulling the water up the plant. What is that something? That's our transpiration. When those pores are opened and that water molecule leaves, because water has cohesion and those molecules stick together, that's going to pull the water 
up the plant. It's going to pull it up from the bottom, from the roots, up to the leaves where photosynthesis can take place. So water having cohesion is really important for the transport of water up a plant because you need to have water molecules stick together to pull the water up um, the plant because it's going against gravity. The other reason that cohesion is important is that it accounts for surface tension. If you've ever taken a glass and you've tried to fill it with water, you might notice that you can fill it a little bit above the top of the glass. That's because those water molecules stick together. It has this surface tension, which keeps it from going over the glass. Now, eventually, if you keep filling it up, it will go over, but it will allow you to fill it a little bit above the top. Surface tension is also responsible for these water striders, these water walking insects that can walk across water. And that's because that water has enough surface tension that the insect can walk along it. Cohesion also is um, important for drops of water. Like if I were to take wax paper and I were to put water on the wax paper, well, the water is going to stick together up to a point, And that's because water has cohesion, it sticks together. Water also has a great capacity to absorb and retain heat. This has to do with a quality called specific heat. Specific heat is the amount of energy required to raise the temperature of a substance by one degree Celsius. Water has a high specific heat. And what that means is that it requires a greater input of energy to get the temperature to go up by one degree. Temperature is basically a, um, a measurement of the rate of vibrations of the molecules. So when you apply heat to a liquid, what happens to molecular motion? What happens to the movement of those molecules? Well, if you apply heat, molecules move faster, right? Those molecules start bouncing around, they're gonna start to vibrate, and when they vibrate, that's gonna increase temperature, right? So adding heat is gonna cause molecular motion to increase, which is going to then raise the temperature, which is a measurement of the rate of the vibrations of the molecules. However, when heat is applied to water, remember that water molecules have cohesion, they stick together. That hydrogen bond between water molecules is gonna restrain some of the bouncing, meaning that at any given amount of heat, the temperature rises more slowly with water per unit heat. So water at any given temperature has more heat than most liquids. It stores that heat because it has, you have to input more heat to raise the temperature by one degree. Because again, temperature is a measurement of the rate of movement of the molecules. Because water can hydrogen bond, right, because it has cohesion and it sticks together, that's gonna restrain that bouncing. So they're not gonna bounce as quickly and therefore more heat has to be applied to get the temperature to go up by one degree. So if you've ever been cooking and you heat up oil or you heat up water, which one is going to heat up faster? Answer is the oil is gonna heat up faster. And that's because again, water has a high specific heat. It takes a lot more input of energy to get the temperature to raise by one degree Celsius. And that's because water has hydrogen bonding, which restrains some of that bouncing. The reason that this is important for life on Earth is that this property that water has a high specific heat accounts for moderate climates around bodies of water. And that's because water absorbs and stores heat in the summer with little temperature change, and then it releases heat in the winter. So think about us in California. What we call winter, m most of our country would say that's not winter. Our winter is not their winter. 
But to those of us that live in California, we think of, you know, in the 60s and I'm wearing boots and a sweater because I think that's cold. That's because we've grown up in an area where we have the large Pacific Ocean next to us and it's able to moderate the temperature and to keep our temperature relatively constant. So we don't get these huge fluctuations in temperature that other parts of the country get when they actually get, you know, minus 10 degree weather and it's snowing and it's a blizzard. We don't really see that next to the ocean, right? We don't really have that type of temperature because we have that large Pacific Ocean, which helps moderate our temperature and helps keep our um, environment at a relatively constant temperature. The other property about water is that ice is less dense than water. So what does that mean if we say that ice is less dense than water? Well, first we have to remember that temperature, right, has to do with molecular motion. So if we're comparing liquid water and we're comparing ice, ice is a colder temperature, liquid water is at a warmer temperature. Which one is going to have more molecular motion, the ice or the liquid water? Answer is gonna be the liquid water because liquid water has a higher temperature, therefore the molecules are moving more, and what that means is that if the water molecules are moving, those hydrogen bonds are constantly breaking and reforming and breaking and reforming. And so at any one time, on average, a water molecule is only involved in about 3.4 hydrogen bonds. It's not forming its maximum four because these molecules in liquid water are in motion. Those bonds are breaking, reforming, breaking and reforming. In ice, when the temperature goes down, right, when temperature decreases, molecular motion decreases. And as molecules start to slow down or they stop moving, if the temperature gets cold enough, that means that now with the water not moving, uh, the water molecules are going to be able to form their maximum of four hydrogen bonds. And what happens is, is when they form their maximum four hydrogen bonds, they form this crystal lattice structure. And what ends up happening is, is if you look at the ice and you look at density, which is the amount of water molecules per space, per given area, the ice is less dense than the water. Notice that in the ice, the water molecules are much more spread out than they are in liquid water. So ice is less dense than water. You've seen this if you ever put ice in a cup and you drink ice water, right? When you add the water, the ice is gonna float to the top because the ice is less dense than water. So why does that matter? Well, because if you think about large bodies of water and when they freeze in the winter, the top of the water is gonna freeze but the ice is less dense than the water. So the ice is gonna remain at the top, but the bottom is gonna remain liquid water. And so this is essential for life on Earth because lakes and oceans don't freeze solid. The top is gonna to form ice, but the bottom is not. And you've probably seen this in movies when people fall through the ice, right? That's because the top is ice, but underneath is liquid water. And that's an important property because that allows life to exist underneath where the ice is formed. So ice is gonna expand, right? When frozen, it's gonna spread out and it becomes less dense. You've probably seen that water expands when frozen if you've ever made the mistake of putting, let's say a soda can in the freezer. Like you go to the grocery store and you buy soda and you want to drink it soon. So you take that soda and you put it in the freezer to try and cool it down very quickly. Well, if you're like me and you get distracted and you forget that you stuck that in there, you might come back to open your freezer to find a very big mess. Because if you leave that soda in there and the water in there, 
expands when frozen, it's going to expand within the aluminum and it's going to cause that soda to explode. And that's because water expands when frozen. That's different than a lot of other things. Things like metal, for example, tend to constrict when frozen. But ice has this unique property in that it actually expands when frozen. And so when ice expands when frozen, it's now less dense than liquid water. And so that allows life to, to live under the ice. Another important property is that water is a solvent for life. And what is a solvent? Well, a solvent is a substance which something is being dissolved. So the solvent is what's doing the dissolving. The solute is what's being dissolved. So if I take salt and I mix it with water, right? My salt is what's going to be dissolved. This is my solute. And my water is going to be my solvent. It's what's doing the dissolving. So I mix my salt in my water. I maybe stir to mix it. And what I get is a solution. And the solution is a completely homogeneous mixture made of two or more different, two or more substances. So salt and water, the solution would be salt water. The salt would be dissolved in the water. Water is a great solvent. It has a great ability to be able to dissolve many different things. And you're going to see why in just a minute. So why is water such a great solvent? It again comes down to, like many other parts of water's important properties, comes down to that water is polar. Because water is polar, it has charges. So if you think about salt or sodium chloride, right, remember that chloride is going to be negative and sodium is going to be positive. So the partially positive hydrogens, right, so here's our partially positive hydrogens on the water, is going to surround the negatively charged chlorides because opposites attract. The partially negative oxygens on the water will surround sodium. So what ends up happening is water is going to form these hydration shells. These shells, like the, they're going to coat each of these ions. And so they're going to pull apart the salt crystal little by little by forming these hydration shells and that pulls apart that salt crystal. Salt, when not in an aqueous solution, so meaning when salt is dry, it's very strong. However, if you take salt and you put it in water, that bond is not very strong anymore. The water is gonna form those hydration shells and it's gonna pull the salt apart. Now, if you've ever been like me, um, when you get sick, if you get like a sore throat and you gargle warm salt water, if you've ever gone to make salt water, warm salt water, You've probably experienced at some point, if you pour in too much salt, if I pour in a whole bunch of salt, is all of that salt going to dissolve in that water? The answer is no. Think about why that is. Because if I pour in an excess of salt, if I pour in more salt than there is water available, I've reached what's called saturation. There's no longer enough water molecules to pull that salt apart. And so not all of the salt is going to dissolve. So now you know if you make salt water and you don't get all the salt to dissolve, it means that you have more salt relative to the water and the water is, not, is no longer able to dissolve the salt because there's not enough water molecules present to pull that salt apart. And so ionic compounds are gonna break down in water and that's because water is polar. So we have a term for if water can interact with a particular substance, if we call something hydrophilic. Hydro refers to water, philic is loving. So if we call something hydrophilic, it's water loving. This is a substance that has an affinity to water.
So that means that it's able to interact with water. These are substances that can hydrogen bond or interact with the water. And examples of things that are hydrophilic would be ionic compounds, like salt, for example, right? Because salt can interact with the water. Or polar molecules, sucrose, for example, which is table sugar. So if you've ever taken, you know, sugar and put it in your coffee, the sugar is going to dissolve. That's because the sugar is polar. It has what we call hydroxyl groups, these OH groups all over it. Oxygen and hydrogen, different electronegativities. Those hydroxyl groups will make that sugar be polar, and therefore that part of the water molecule that's polar can interact with the polar parts of the sugar. Because again, you have charges, and those charges can interact with one another. So basically, hydrophilic substances are things that have some sort of charge, whether it's a full charge in an ionic compound or a partial charge with polar molecules. If there's any charge, it should be able to interact with water and therefore would be hydrophilic. Things that are hydrophobic. This is where when you start to learn the roots of the words, it's going to make biology so much easier for you. So we said hydro refers to water. Think about what phobic means. If I'm arachnophobic, what does that mean? It means that I have a fear of spiders. If I'm claustrophobic, I have a fear of small spaces. So hydrophobic is water fearing. These are substances that do not interact with water. They're excluded. They are repelled by the water. And that's because these substances cannot hydrogen bond with the water. What are things that are hydrophobic? This would include things that are nonpolar and non-ionic. Again, if they don't have a charge, they can't interact with water. So oil, for example. Oil or fats are primarily hydrocarbons. We said hydrocarbons, carbon and hydrogen, similar electronegativities. Therefore, when they share... They will share, but they'll share equally, and the molecule doesn't have a charge. If that lipid doesn't have a charge, it's not able to interact with the water, and therefore it's going to be repelled. So again, going back to cooking, if you've ever taken water and you pour oil in, you know that the oil doesn't dissolve. The oil stays in these little pools in the water because the oil is hydrophobic. It's nonpolar, it's not able to interact with the water, and therefore it's not going to be dissolved in the water. Question for you. You add sugar to black coffee, and the sugar dissolves. Thus, the coffee is the blank, and the sugar is the blank. Is it red, solute for the first blank, solvent for the second? Yellow, solvent, solute. Green, polar covalent bond, nonpolar covalent bond. Blue, nonpolar covalent bond, polar covalent bond, or purple ionic bond and hydrogen bond. So again, this will be a question that will be on the practice quiz. So we are going to kind of finish off our chemistry lecture with acids, bases, and pH. So a pH scale, pH stands for potential of hydrogen. And it's used to describe whether a solution is acidic or basic. So basically a pH scale is a measurement of the concentration of hydrogen ions. When we measure our pH scale, pH scale typically ranges from 0 to 14. 0 being like the most acidic, 14 being the most basic or alkaline. If we're looking at the concentration of hydrogen ions, so here is my hydrogen ion concentration. When you see brackets around hydrogens, that means that's the concentration of hydrogen ions. So now think of water for a minute. So let's say I have my water molecule, right? And so water, remember, is polar. We have oxygen and two hydrogens. Remember that oxygen is more electronegative than hydrogen. 
So sometimes the electron gets stolen, meaning the oxygen is going to fully take the electron from the hydrogen. So water is going to dissociate. It's going to break down. And this bond is going to get broken because the electron goes to the oxygen. And what you end up with is a hydroxide, which is an OH minus. Notice when we write hydroxide, the minus is over here on the right. But what you want to realize is that in actuality, the electron, the negative, is actually on the oxygen. It's just we write it OH minus. So that's a hydroxide. And that is going to separate from the hydrogen ion. Because this H that's left, when it gave up its electron, all that's left is a proton. So water can dissociate into hydroxide ions and hydrogen ions. So when we talk about a neutral pH, neutral pH is a pH of 7. And notice that is when the concentration of hydrogen ions is equal to the concentration of hydroxide ions. Because pure water... When it breaks apart, you're going to have an equal amount of OH minus and an equal amount of H plus. So pure water, we're not talking tap water, but pure water has a pH of 7. That's what we call a neutral pH. The concentration of hydrogens is equal to the concentrations of hydroxides. Now, when you go numbers less than 7, that is increasing your hydrogen ion concentration. And that's because the hydrogen scale, the hydrogen ion concentration, is a log scale. It's logarithmic. And so when we talk about a pH 0, the concentration of hydrogen ions is 10 to the 0 power. If we talk about a pH of 1, 10 to the negative 1. pH of 2, 10 to the negative 2. 10 to the negative 3, and so on and so forth. So notice that as my pH number goes up, so we'll put a note, so increase pH equals a decrease in the hydrogen ion concentration. Because as my pH number goes up, notice, so as I go from 0 to 1 to 2 to 3, my hydrogen ion concentration goes down. The exponents are negative. So 10 to the negative 1 is a bigger number than 10 to the negative 2. So as my pH number is going up, hydrogen ion concentration is going down. They are what we call inversely related. As one goes up, the other goes down. That is also inversely related with the hydroxide ion concentration. So as hydrogen ion concentration goes down, my hydroxide ion concentration goes up. So notice that the more basic the solution, the more hydroxide ions you have. The more acidic the solution, the higher the hydrogen ion concentration. So if we look at some examples, you do not need to memorize these examples of what is the pH of lemon juice. I don't care that you know that, okay? But this is just to give you some examples of things that are acidic or basic. Um, so stomach acid is very acidic. When we get to our digestion um, lecture, we will talk about why that's important. Uh, lemon juice, grapefruit juice, wine, tomato juice, Urine is slightly acidic. Um, milk is slightly acidic. Um, if we look at things that are increasing in alkaline, um, meaning they're more basic, ammonia, bleach, for example, these would be things that are more on the alkaline side. One of the things that you want to be aware of is that because the pH scale is logarithmic, each change in pH unit is a tenfold change in hydrogen ions. So a pH with a solution of 9 is 10 times as basic as a solution with a pH of 8. So now let's make sure you understand this. So if I am comparing a pH 4 versus pH 6. So I'm comparing pH 4 
versus pH 6. Which one is more acidic? So we'll ask that first. Which one is more acidic? Answer is pH 4. Which one has the higher hydrogen ion concentration? pH 4, because the lower the pH number, the higher the hydrogen ions. Now the next question I'm going to ask is how much more hydrogens does a pH 4 have versus a pH 6? Now oftentimes if I were to ask this question, students want to say, well, between 4 and 5 is 10, and between 5 and 6 is 10. So a lot of students want to say, well, pH 4 has 20 times more because each change is tenfold. But what you need to realize is that you don't add those, you multiply. So pH 4 to 5 is tenfold, pH 5 to 6 is tenfold. So it's 10 times 10. So basically, the way you can write this is 10 to the second power. That's the difference between 4 and 6. So 10 to the second power is the same as a 1 with two zeros. If I were to compare pH, whoops, sorry, pH 8 versus pH 2. pH 8 versus pH 2. Which one has more hydrogen ions? Answer, pH 2, right? Because the lower the pH number, the higher the hydrogen ions. How many more hydrogen ions does the pH 2 have relative to the pH 8. So if you need a little bit of time to think about that, just pause your video, and then when you're ready, push play. But pH 2 versus pH 8, 10 to the sixth power. That exponent is the difference between them. So 10 to the sixth power, that is a one with six zeros. Pen's being a little weird, sorry about that. So it's a one with six zeros, so a million. pH two has a million more hydrogen ions relative to a pH of eight. Think about if you were to compare pH zero versus pH 14, 10 to the 14th power. That is how much more hydrogens a pH zero has relative to a pH 14. So each change in pH is equal to a tenfold change in hydrogen ions. So if we say that a solution is an acid, an acid is a substance that releases or adds, acids add H plus to solution, and they increase the hydrogen ion concentration. So that's because they will add hydrogens to the solution. So an example of an acid would be hydrochloric acid, HCl. That's because if you think about hydrogen and chlorine, do they have similar electronegativities? No, not at all. Chlorine is very, very electronegative. So if you take hydrochloric acid and you put it in water, for example, Chlorine is more electronegative than hydrogen. Chlorine is going to take the electron from hydrogen and it's gonna form a chloride ion and a hydrogen ion. So when you add that HCl, you're gonna increase your hydrogen ion concentration because you're putting in H plus into the solution. As a result, the pH is gonna be less than seven because remember that a pH of seven means that the hydroxides are equal to the hydrogens. If we add more hydrogens, the pH is gonna go less than seven. So acids are gonna make the pH go down. Bases, on the other hand, are gonna do the opposite. Bases are substances that release hydroxides into the solutions, and that will decrease the hydrogen ion concentration. And this one sometimes is a little more tricky for students to comprehend about why hydroxides make hydrogens go down. So I'm gonna draw this out for you. So if we have sodium hydroxide, NaOH, remember that sodium has one valence electron. Oxygen is very electronegative. 
So when you put sodium hydroxide into water, the oxygen is going to take the electron and it's going to form hydroxides and the sodium gave up its electrons. So that's why you get sodium ions. So when you add in NaOH into the solution, so let's say, let's add a little more NaOH in here. And you have to remember that if we're talking about water, water is going to already have some hydrogens and some hydroxides. And if it was pure water, the amount of hydroxides will be equal to the amount of hydrogen. So notice that I drew three hydroxides, one, two, three, and I drew three hydrogens. And so if I add in sodium hydroxide and I increase the OHs in the solution, those OHs are gonna bond with free hydrogens in the solution. So notice they're gonna form a bond. And when they form the bond, now the hydrogen ion concentration is lower. I had three free hydrogens before. Now I only have one. So by adding in hydroxides, by adding in those OHs, those hydroxides are gonna interact with free hydrogens, they're gonna form water, and that is going to decrease your hydrogen ion concentration. So notice that your pH is gonna go up and it's gonna go up to seven, um, above seven. So that is your base. So your base, you're adding in hydroxides, for example, and when you add in those OHs, the hydroxides are gonna interact with the free hydrogens and that will decrease your hydrogen ion concentration. When we talk about ionic compounds, ionic compounds will um, dissociate in water, but they don't release hydrogen ions or hydroxides, and therefore they don't, they don't change the pH. They simply act as electrolytes. They're used for salt balance, but they're not going to affect your pH. So again, if you put sodium chloride into water, it's gonna break apart to sodium ions and chloride ions, but that's not going to release H plus or hydroxides, and therefore it's not gonna affect the pH. So these ionic compounds are not going to affect the pH like an acid or a base would. So just a review about which of these solutions is an acid, a base, or a neutral. You can push pause to work through this yourself. And then when you're ready, turn it back on to hear your answers. So the one on the left, is that an acid, a base, or a neutral solution? It's an acidic solution because it has more hydrogen ions relative to hydroxides. What about the one in the middle? That is gonna be a neutral solution. Hydrogen ions are gonna equal the hydroxides, so that's neutral. And then the last one, we have more hydroxides relative to hydrogens. So that is gonna be a basic solution. So the last part of this is going to be talking about what are called buffers. And a buffer is a solution that is able to resist change in pH. So it's able to keep the pH constant. And the way that it does that is that if there are not enough hydrogens in the solution, the buffer is going to donate, meaning it's gonna put back H plus that are no longer available. Or if hydrogen ions are in excess, so if we now have too much hydrogens, the buffer is going to accept those hydrogen ions. It's gonna take them away. And when it does that, it's gonna keep the pH constant. So a buffer is a solution that is going to resist a change in pH. It's gonna be there to help keep the pH constant. And that's because the cells are very sensitive to pH changes. They can only tolerate a small window of pHs. So like blood, for example, pH of blood is 7.2 to 7.4. If you go too far outside of that, it's gonna to start to damage cells. And you're gonna see when we talk about macromolecules that the reason that those macromolecules become damaged is because if the hydrogen ion concentration is affected, if we get more H plus in the solution, for example, those hydrogens, those free hydrogens that are now in that solution 
are going to interact with proteins, for example. And proteins are held together by a variety of different bonds. If you now add hydrogens to the solution, it causes proteins to do something that we call denature. The proteins start to unfold, and if the proteins are not folded properly, they're not going to function properly, and the cell can't function properly. So cells can be very sensitive to pH changes, and the way that cells adapt and try and keep the pH constant is by having these buffers. And these buffers are there to keep the pH constant. If there's too many hydrogens, the buffer is going to take them away. If there are not enough, the buffer is going to donate hydrogens. So this is a demo that I will do in Zoom talking about how buffers work. It's easier to see a demonstration for this, so I will do this in Zoom to, under, to explain how buffers work. And then lastly in Zoom, you are going to discuss this with classmates. I want you to go through and fill this in. This is gonna help you study your terminology for the chemistry chapter. So atoms have positively charged what? So what part of the atom is positively charged? And then it says number present equals, and they gave you the next one, which is the atomic number of the element. So that helps you fill in A. Atoms have neutral, and then you're going to fill in B. Number may differ. D would be this. So when you write this out, you can keep it in this format. You could write it on a paper like A equals what word it is, B equals this. One thing I want to point out is sometimes more than one term might fit in a box, and that's okay. That is completely possible that more than one term might be a possibility. Just put one that you came up with, and I will discuss some of the other options if you didn't think about those. So this is just to review your terms for, chem for your chemistry. And so this will conclude the chemistry lecture.